Greetings, everybody. Um, thank you so much for being here uh, tonight. I'm so glad that we could reschedule this. Um, as uh, Wei Nao uh, said, that first time we were um, pushed back because of the snow, a blanket of whiteness had taken us out. <laughs> but we are here to reclaim our time. Thank you, Maxine Waters. Um, so I'm Django Paris, director of the Bank Center uh, for Educational Justice. They never quite make these podiums for me, so I kind of have to. Um, the Bank Center for Educational Justice is a, a new center that carries on the legacy, the beautiful legacy of James Banks and the uh, Center for Multicultural Education and also uh, the work of Cherry Banks. So I'm pleased to welcome you all uh, here today, or tonight rather. I'd like to begin uh, by acknowledging that the University of Washington, like all of our lives and institutions, exists on indigenous land. We gather on the ancestral homelands of those who walked here before us and those who still walk here, keeping in mind the integrity of this territory where native peoples identify as the Duwamish, the Suquamish, Snoqualmie, and Puyallup, as well as the tribes of Muckleshoot, Tulalip, and other Coast Salish peoples, as well as their descendants. And I'm grateful to respectively live and work as a guest on these lands with the Coast Salish and native peoples who call it home. I've learned and continue to learn from Native peoples that such land acknowledgement should be rooted in ongoing relationships, in permissions, should be about doing work with the people and the land in a good way as we push for educational justice and an education system that continues to live out the legacies of the settler colonial legacies of land theft, genocide, and enslavement. And as I mentioned permission and relationship, let me thank Don Hardison Stevens, Nancy Jo Bob, Tammy Hone and Anthony Craig for sharing their knowledge about their peoples and lands as I continue to learn and any errors in these acknowledgements are mine alone. So the center uh, seeks to uphold our responsibility to the lands and the peoples, whether at our gathering for native teacher education, which is co-hosted by the indigenous education initiatives. And uh, it's a couple, a two day event, but uh, we'll be here at 5 p.m. Um, in the Walker Ames room in Kane Hall uh, to welcome our guests, uh, Yakima Scholar, uh, Michelle Jacob, Alutik Scholar, Leilani Zalian, uh, Hopi Scholar, Jeremy Garcia, and Dene Scholar, Valerie Sh Shirley, and they'll be here to share their beautiful work uh, with Native Cohort Teacher Programs as we work to center teachers and education in our own programs, uh, te uh, uh, Native teachers and Native education here in our own pro programs at, at UW. And we also seek to uphold this responsibility uh, through our summer graduate course entitled Black and Indigenous Theories of Educational Liberation and Resurgent. If I was a graduate student and had any way of taking this class, I would be in that class. So um, get it together uh, and, and sign up. Um, I also want to mention this uh, beautiful event uh, that's coming uh, next month, the Lee Shine Gold Lecture organized by creative writing professor Ray Paris and the English department, which will take place right in this very room uh, at 7 p.m. There's a reception with food beforehand, hey. Um, and this is a conversation between Anishinaabe writer and scholar Leanne Simpson and black feminist writer and scholar Alexis Pauling Gums. Just an extraordinary event and an opportunity to hear two really brilliant and important people in our communities. So today uh, we are here to focus on this beautiful book that is part of this beautiful and necessary movement to center black lives in education. And I wanna make explicit the center's commitment to black educational justice and also its in inextricable link, the inextricable link between black and native peoples here on Turtle Island. As Dakota organizer Tanya Black Elk puts it, these are stolen lands built by stolen hands. So please check us out um, in terms of, of, of the things we're starting to, uh, we're, we're trying to join here, the beautiful ongoing work um, in Seattle across the state. Um, and there's some different ways to keep uh, connected with us. Um, if you're interested in live tweeting this event, um, Black Lives Matter at School, um, hashtag UW Ed Justice, and of course, uh, the original hashtag that, that started this movement, right? Hashtag Black Lives Matter. Um, that was in response um, to the murder of Trayvon Martin. And as I mentioned Trayvon, tomorrow is the anniversary of his murder. And uh, of course, the movement started by three black women, uh, Alicia Garza, um, Patrice Coulors, and uh, Opal Tometi. And so uh, we honor their work, and we think of Trayvon and everyone um, who has lost their lives in this anti-black state. So at the end, we may have time for questions. We're going to push for that. And um, there will be a book signing, and there's a bunch of wonderful um, uh, books uh, available. 
um, at this table over here. Um, I also want to acknowledge our co-sponsors for this event, the Seattle Association Center for Race and Equity and the Seattle Public Schools Ethnic Studies Program, doing such beautiful work um, in our communities and for and with our communities. And I'm just thankful, as I just have been here for a year, um, to, to try to join in that work. I also want to say a, a huge thanks to our research assistant, Jasmine Moore, and our program coordinators, Kent Jewell and Justine Zen, for all their work on this event. They really um, helped make this possible. I've been asked to just, um, I mean, there are so many amazing things going on. So, um, you know, that, those, that series of snowstorms also took out the, um, the final event of the Black Lives Matter at School Week, right? And so they have rescheduled for March 8th, 6 to 8 p.m. at Cleveland High. It's the Black Lives Matter at School Rally and Student Talent Showcase. This is going to be beautiful. And so you do not want to miss that. And I've also been asked to mention that these t-shirts are going to be are available for sale outside after the event. So they have the original t-shirt, they have this one which came up out a, a year or two after, something like that. And then also um, this year's edition. So if you want to check those out, they'll be outside. This is a real community event, I'm telling you. Um, anybody else that got anything they need? <laughs> Um, so we appreciate you, and I'm really pleased and honored to introduce first here uh, Wayne Al, um, who is of course a professor at U UW Bothell, but uh, most importantly a father, a critical and radical educator, and co-editor of, uh, of this wonderful book um, that we're here to celebrate, and, and, and such an important member of this, uh, of this movement. So, Wayne Al. Thank you, Django. All right. Um, so uh, before I get into to my little part tonight, uh, I got to do my shout outs too. Um, first shout out goes to Django and the Center for Educational Justice. I can't tell you how much it means to have sort of um, what I see as a, a really sharp shift in, 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 in the best way possible of sort of the radical politics that we can take up here at UW. And so I really, really appreciate uh, you and the work that's happening here and tonight being a perfect example of that. Um, also want to shout out Rethinking Schools, uh, just understand that, you know, Teacher for Black Lives and this work, you know, a lot of the work that Jesse and I do ends up being, you know, part of our love for the project of sort of teaching for social and environmental justice and, and Rethinking Schools is an incredible nonprofit and so we, don't, we always want to make sure that folks understand that, that, you know, these book projects like Teacher for Black Lives come about because of Rethinking Schools politics and their commitment to this work. Um, and it's, and we, don't, we don't want to get stuck in sort of separating the book from the, the larger political project as well. There's a few folks who aren't here uh, that I want to give shout outs to. Uh, Marquita Prinzing, she's, uh, she, she's one of the leads uh, on the racial justice work um, for the uh, SEA Center for uh, Race and Equity. Um, also Tracy Castro-Gill is the department head for Seattle Public Schools Ethnic Studies. And Tracy's been, uh, they've, together Marquita and Tracy have been doing incredible amounts of work uh, across the district, across Seattle Public Schools. Also, I have to shout out to Rita Green, who we wanted to be here. She used to be head of the uh, King County NAACP Education Chair. Uh, now she's Education Chair for the statewide level. Um, and Rita's been an incredible advocate at all sorts of levels for us uh, here locally and across, across the county and state. Uh, she just couldn't be here with us tonight. Uh, just, uh, she does, does incredible work. Um, but you're going to hear from some other folks later tonight. So just so you get a quick overview, I'm going to talk a little bit about the origins of some of the work, the Black Lives Matter work here in Seattle Public Schools, just because it connects to me very personally. Um, then we're going to hear from Jesse, and he's going to address some things around sort of the need for this work and what it looks like in terms of classroom stuff. Uh, then we're going to hear from uh, first uh, Sabrina uh, Burr, who is also an amazing advocate for students here in Seattle schools. And she was, um, uh, at the time a lot of this work was going down, she was the president of the uh, citywide, Seattle citywide uh, PTA and was an important uh, ally for us. And then Jennifer Charlton, who does both wings of working for both the uh, Center for uh, Race and Equity as well as the Seattle Schools Ethnic Studies Department. And then we're going to hear from some students as well. And we're going to use that to round out the night just because their voices are, are amazing. Okay, so let me just spend a few minutes right now, because I don't have that much time, talking about the beginnings. It's weird for me to think about it, but the beginnings of this here in Seattle and, and maybe, I don't know, maybe nationwide, like I, we have to look at the timelines. But this is a picture of John Muir Elementary. 
My son is a third grader there right now. Okay, but we got to go back to a little over two years ago when my son was, uh, uh, what was he? He was in first grade, I think. And, um, and, and what happened then was um, you see Deshaun Jackson right there uh, with the dreads, uh, kind of towards middle ish. Uh, and Deshaun was trying to organize an event uh, for John Muir Elementary called 100 Black Men Changing the Narrative in Education. And the point of this was to get organized 100 black men to come to school and just welcome the kids. Right, um, and you know, high fives and all that kind of stuff. And so some, some other schools have done it under like the 100 high fives kind of moniker. Um, and so, so Deshaun was organizing that piece. And, and you have to understand, like John Muir Elementary, it's in Seattle's Rainier Valley. Uh, it's you know, somewhere uh, close to like, uh, shoot, I think it's like 70% free and reduced lunch if you wanna take that as, a, as one marker of, 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 of poverty, um, uh, just, uh, uh, he, like uh, about half, about half African American uh, student population, um, uh, sizable Latino population, smaller Asian American community there, uh, huge immigrant population, uh, a lot of Muslim students as well. So this is a school that is definitely highly impacted by the current uh, racial politics of the time and the fascist tendencies and the alt right stuff. Like like Muir uh, has the kind of kids that uh, you know those alt right folks hate, right? Um, and so, and so, you know, Muir, in that context then, John Muir had been trying to do some work for a number of years, uh, a number of years, both with also Julie Trout. Uh, I think that's Julie right next to Deshaun. I think it's kind of blurry. Uh, she's an amazing, amazing art teacher at John Muir Elementary, like incredible, does a lot of, uh, she works as a white ally and does a lot of racial justice work through art. Um, and so uh, the school staff have been doing some racial justice work for a good amount of time, maybe one or two years before this, uh, before all this stuff went down. So anyways, so back to the main part of the story. Deshaun is organizing this event. And so the staff, uh, again, after they've been doing some racial justice work in sort of terms of professional development, uh, decides to uh, uh, stand in solidarity with Deshaun's event. And so they decide to create these t-shirts and Julie Trout designed them that say uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, John Muir Elementary, we stand together. I have the slides. There's a t-shirt. But then, somehow, it got out to the local news, okay? And, and, so, uh, and so, it, so it, went, it went to a local news station, and then let's see, right? Here's KUOW. Oh, I thought, sorry, I went too far. So it went out to a local news station, and then it went from there, it got out to Breitbart and Blue Lives Matter, okay? And so you gotta imagine what happened. There was, a, like, there was, there was, a, a massive attack on, on not just Seattle Public Schools, but specifically John, John Muir Elementary. And when I mean that, like, like phone calls, like de the desk staff were getting calls from all sorts of folks saying all sorts of nasty stuff. Principal was getting emails, like things blew up around it. Um, and then eventually what happened is on a chat room somewhere, okay, somebody, uh, somebody posted a bomb threat on the school. And I always want, whenever I talk about this, I always want to be really clear about what that means. Like, so, so there, that means there's somebody out there who's willing to threaten the lives of kids, black and brown kids, working class black and brown kids, you know, from the age of five to 12 or years old, right? There's someone willing to threaten that over, over this t-shirt and over the statement and over the support of, of, of them and who they are and their identities in schooling, okay? And so officially, the event got canceled, right? Um, I remember a super intense time. Uh, I had to, I, the principal, the, the, the principal like, was freaking out. And I was like, look, I've been through some of these attacks before. Let's talk about it. We had to go walk around the block, help her try and breathe and, and work through it. Um, so what happened, though, is we did it anyways. We officially canceled it with the district, but then we went ahead and had a party that day anyways. Okay, it was awesome. Well, now we didn't have the 100 black men show up. Yeah, yeah, it is, it is worth a round of applause. We had, we had drummers, we had like, like this is my own shot for my cell phone on that day. Like we, we just said, screw it, right? Because what happened was the district canceled it. We officially, officially had to cancel it. They shut down the school that morning. They brought bomb sniffing dogs onto campus and they searched the school, all right? Um, and then they increased police presence. But we were like, you know what, screw it. We can't let, we can't let the racist like, trolls stop us from doing this work, okay? So we went ahead and did it. We wore the t-shirts. 
We did, we did the thing, and it was incredible. Now, the other part of the beauty of this was that what happened at Muir blossomed into a district-wide event. Okay, so almost immediately through organizing in uh, Seattle Education Association and then specifically social equality educators, which is sort of a left-wing caucus within, within the union, um, they, they organized solidarity with the John Muir teachers through the union. Okay, and then, so then the union got on board. And then Sabrina um, and her crew at the, at the citywide PTA, they're like, we're going to support these guys too. And so they, they jumped on board, right? And so imagine, so here's what we had. We had the union, the teachers united, right? Um, and, and then we started pushing for doing a, a day-long event in, in solidarity uh, with, with the Muir teachers and doing something, a, a district-wide Black Lives Matter event. Um, and so we were, people started organizing curriculum. It was, it was, it was really incredible. T-shirts. Uh, oh, there's, there's a side of Sabrina right there, too. Uh, like, we had, we had the press conference. Um, all that. We just took, we took it big, all right? Um, and then the amazing thing happened... I couldn't, couldn't believe it. I remember when I got the email. Like, so we're pushing this. We're organizing out in the schools. We, uh, we ended up selling like 3,000 Black Lives Matter t-shirts to be worn by teachers across Seattle schools just for that one day. Um, uh, we organized, uh, well, Jesse and a bunch of the crew organized a, a huge uh, celebration event for the end of the day. We had people writing curriculum and doing things for, for folks to teach. Um, there was rallies. There's all sorts of stuff. But the amazing thing was, is like leading up to it, suddenly we got an email from the district. Do you remember this? Uh, uh, we got an email from the district, from the superintendent, saying, uh, we support the Black Lives Matter at School Day because it's in line with the racial justice initiatives of Seattle schools. And we were like I, like, I, like, I had to pick my job off the floor. I couldn't believe the district endorsed Black Lives Matter. It was incredible. And so, so we had the day. Uh, this is Steps of Garfield, right? I don't know if you're in this picture, Jesse. Um, but uh, yeah, so we, we had the day, and it was, it, it was incredible. I mean, it wasn't perfect. Right, the curriculum was unevenly done, and you know I think it means it's one thing for like schools in the south end of Seattle to do uh, this kind of curriculum and do support Black Lives Matter. I think some of the schools in, in other parts of the city might have had a little more difficult time uh, implementing the racial justice curriculum. But these are things that we work through. Oh yeah, so I think that's the end of mine. So yeah, so this is how it really kicked off, and 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 now it's really grown. Jesse will talk a little bit more later, I'm sure, but we. You know, when originally when we planned this event, it was going to be on the first day of the Black Lives Matter in School Week, which was a national event, which helped grow out of the work that happened in Seattle, right? Um, and, and, but that's part of why the book got made. It was like, we did this stuff, and we're like, man, we need, we need a text that can help teach folks about this. That's why the book got made and really became sort of, a, to me, the beginning of a lot of the, the larger push um, uh, around the country. So I, I'm done there. Thank you, everybody. And uh, Jess is going to talk for a few minutes now. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for coming out tonight. It's wonderful to be with future teachers in the room and with current teachers and people who want to help transform this, this school system. And Wayne uh, so brilliantly laid out this movement that's doing just that. And I want to talk a little bit about the urgency of doing this work before I pick up a little bit on the story of how it expanded nationally. Um, but our book, Teaching for Black Lives, starts with that sentence up there. Black students' bodies and minds are under attack and we're fighting back, right? And that, that's what's happening. I want to explain what we mean by that uh, first. When we say black bodies are under attack, I don't have time to go through all the stories of how black students are being physically abused in our schools. But these are just from the last uh, few months. And I made this presentation when we were originally doing the event during the first week of February. And since then, there's a few more that we need to add to, to this, unfortunately. Um, so you have the, the story. Um, from this boy up here at the top, his face uh, is bloodied, and what happened was he's in a school outside of New Orleans, and 
He came into class smelling like cigarettes. Well, he's 18 years old, so he's legally of age, uh, but they brought the police in anyway and body slammed him. And then that wasn't enough for that officer. So the officer took him back to his office and bloodied his face so bad that when he FaceTimed his mom to say what had happened, she didn't recognize him. So that was just a, f a couple weeks ago. Um, then you have this incident out of uh, Binghamton, New York. Did people hear about the four girls in Binghamton, New York? Right? These four middle school girls are strip searched because the administration said they were acting giddy. Right? So here you have, of course, de developmentally appropriate behavior for an adolescent at recess, acting giddy. Right? But if you're a black girl and you have to bear the oppression of the intersection of racism and sexism, then you get labeled defiant and uh, they got humiliated right, by, by, those, by those staff. Um, did people see the viral video of the high school wrestler? That one really got out there and showed something that's been going on in the schools for a long time. Uh, the criminalization of black hair, right? And so the, the referee said he had to cut his dreadlocks before he could wrestle, and right in front of that entire crowd, his dreadlocks are cut off and just humiliated in front of everybody, and nobody said anything? I mean, he did win the match, which was pretty cool. Um, but that was outrageous, and this, this boy looking up at you um, just started school in kindergarten, and his first day of school, they say you're out of compliance with the dress code because of your dreadlocks, and there's a heartbreaking video that you can watch on YouTube of his dad pleading with the staff to let his son go to school. And them's nothing we can do. He's out of compliance with the, with the dress code. These boys down here, black and Latino, uh, third graders, uh, special needs students, were having a rough day. Might have had a temper tantrum. So the police came to handcuff them. The only problem was their wrists were too small to handcuff, so they had to handcuff them around the biceps, Right? Uh, this is what's happening in, co in schools across the country, and we're not immune from it here in, in our own state. Did people hear what happened in the Kent School District? A special needs 11-year-old uh, boy was locked out of his school by a principal uh, because he was having a hard time in class. Instead of finding out how to nurture and support our black youth who are going through difficult times, right? It, it's about punishing and pushing uh, students out. And there was an 11-year-old boy in Florida who was just arrested for refusing to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. This is the criminalization of our black youth that's happening around the country uh, at an accelerated rate right now. And it's not just the black Bodies that are under attack, we're talking about black minds are under attack in the classroom as well. So this is an example from Connecticut, the Connecticut Adventure textbook. This is a fourth grade textbook that was used in Connecticut up until last year when a girl came home with her homework and question six said, how were the slaves treated in Connecticut? And she wrote, slaves were treated badly and cruelly and were treated like animals and goods. And then she crossed that out. And she wrote, slaves were treated like members of the family. And her mom saw that and said, wait, wait, what, what's wrong? Why did you cross out the right answer and write something so horrible? She said, Mom, it's not horrible, it's the right answer. And she proved it to her mom right there in the textbook. 
Connecticut did not have many slaves. Some people owned one or two slaves. They often cared for and protected them like members of the family. They taught them to be Christian and sometimes to read and write. Almost like they were doing us a favor. It's really breathtaking to see the kind of humiliation that black students have to endure in the curriculum. Maybe you saw this uh, viral tweet of a homework assignment that happened in a charter school in Texas last year. A life of a slave, a balanced view. This teacher sent the kids home with this T-chart asking them to write the positive aspects of slavery on this side and then the negative over there. This student is probably going to be working at the, the bank center very soon. They wrote N.A. Took a picture of the homework assignment and um, it went viral. Now, of course, there's a problem with this teacher who shouldn't be in a classroom if they're going to be uh, asking black students to, to degrade themselves like this, right? But to me, if it was just like these individual teachers doing a bad assignment here or there, then we could do retraining or any number of uh, ways uh, to deal with individual problems. But the problem is clearly systemic, and the problem emanates from corporate curriculum that's packaged in our textbooks. And so that assignment actually came from a book called A History of the United States from Prentice Hall. And in this book, it makes the argument, and this book was actually in the book room, in the back book room at Garfield, uh, and I, I couldn't believe it. Um, it says, though most slaves were whipped at some point in their lives, a few never felt the lash. Nor did all slaves work in the field. Some were house servants or skilled artisans. As if being a house servant was an advantage, actually, especially for women who had to, black women who had to work closer to slave owners, that meant more likelihood of sexual assault and rape. Some were a uh, house servant. Many may not have even been terribly unhappy with their lot, for they knew no other. Right? This is what's passing for history. Uh, nothing but disguised uh, white supremacy. And that's why we're organizing the Black Lives Matter at school movement, because we have to defend black students in public schools. We have to defend their bodies. And we have to defend their minds. And we put together a program to do that with this movement. And it came from John Muir. It came from those courageous elementary school teachers that wanted to publicly declare the value of their black students' lives. And then the teachers in Philadelphia saw what we did in Seattle that, that when we organized that day of action. Over 3,000 teachers in Seattle in 2016 wore the shirts that said Black Lives Matter. We stand together. And that got national attention, and Philadelphia picked it up. And they took what we had done with a day of action and expanded it to a week of action. And then the following year, last year, we actually got coordinated with them and many other cities on monthly conference calls to come up with our demands and a plan for curriculum. And it was an incredible first year. And then this year really surpassed our expectations. And it was truly incredible to see this movement spread to over 30 cities thousands of teachers, tens of thousands of students engaging in lessons about intersectional black identity, about the contributions and the struggles of black people to counter the master narratives that are in these racist corporate uh, textbooks, and to, to fight for structural changes to our public schools like an end to zero tolerance, mandating ethnic studies and black history, hiring more black teachers, We've lost 
26,000 black teachers since 2002 across the country. They're being pushed out uh, of classrooms and not encouraged into the, the profession. And we added a new uh, demand this year. The last one, fund counselors, not cops, right? It's thousands and thousands of dollars uh, for every school, and we need counselors to be able to actually support and nurture our black students to implement uh, restorative justice programs. And the police who are brutalizing our kids need to leave the schools. So uh, incredible movement that we built this year. Amazing to see that Howard County School Board passed a resolution in support of Black Lives Matter. The Philadelphia City Council passed a resolution in support of this movement. Students marched on City Hall in New York City. Here in Seattle, the NAACP Youth Coalition marched on, on our um, school board, and Sabrina uh, Burr will tell you more about that. And I'm uh, so happy to be in this struggle with all of you. So thanks a lot. <laughs> Sabrina? Sabrina, come on up. So happy to welcome Sabrina Burr, uh, one of the advisors of the NAACP Youth Coalition. Thanks so much. Good evening. Um, my most important role is of mother. And I literally went back to school with my now freshman daughter. There are some days that the janitor told me to leave. Um, and many times I was 60 hours in a building. I went there for my daughter, but I found that many other children whose parents couldn't be in the buildings, needed me more than my own daughter. So I became a bridge and a connector. I went home with many broken hearts because sometimes you can just look at a child and to see that they're about to walk into a situation that's not gonna honor them. And just by having a conversation with that child and an adult conversation with adults who are responsible, we can change what happens. But when we have racist principals and racist educators, our hands are tied. But every day, our students walk in awkwardness. I do this work because my baby brother, his dyslexia, was discovered in fifth grade. He thought he had a mental illness, and even though he came from a very strong family, Seattle Public Schools amputated his heart. He was murdered in the streets of downtown Seattle by another black man that the California school system had damaged. So that's why I do this work. I decided <laughs> to be Seattle Council PTSA president, the first person of color to take that role, and there's a reason why. There's a lot of financial loss, and there's a lot of time loss. But when I decided to step up, my family, my mother, my daughter, and my daughter's father said, go for it. And so they supported me in two years. Um, and this work, it has to happen if we're gonna close any gaps in education. Because the truth is, it's not achievement or opportunity gap that we have. The gap that we have is a belief gap. We believe that because of certain students' earth suit, that they're less intelligent. If you look at Seattle Public Schools, their special ed population is 57% students of color. Students of color, you do not see them in their highly capable program. And it's not because these children aren't brilliant, it's because they're not seen for who they were born to this earth to be. So that's why I do this work. Rita Green and I have been doing this work for a while, and um, we were troublemakers at Rainier Beach High School as students. 
So we've been doing this a long time. And we had an opportunity with a King County Best Starts for Kid Trauma-Informed Restorative Practice. So we wrote a grant because we know that black parents need to know how to navigate the system a little bit different. Having a conversation with your child is a little bit different. I had a niece, she was mad. Her son, second grade, wasn't gonna able to eat dinner and she was gonna whoop his ass. That teacher called and he is not gonna embarrass me and he needs to whatever, however she thought he was gonna show up. My first thing was, did you have a conversation with your son? Do you know his side of the story? If he's not acting that way at home, why all of a sudden is it showing up this way? So I had a long conversation about what brown boys experience in school. She started talking to her son different. She found out the Renton School District wouldn't let him talk. This is a bright, intelligent child, curious, full of questions. He's now in Seattle Public Schools with a principal who sees his brilliance. He enjoys going to school. I get a chance, the honor of being with high school students across the district. Rita Green started the NAACP Youth Coalition. They get together a couple times a month and then they do projects and work. What I learned from these students is amazing. What they experience breaks my heart. When they go to Seattle Public School school board meetings, our school board members, they're traumatized because they have no idea what our students are experienced in 2018, 2019 are some of the things that their grandparents experienced 50 years ago. My daughter gave a testimony at the school board uh, meeting um, that they mobilized. I think it was February 6th. Go back and watch that testimony for Seattle Public Schools. The second part starts the testimony. Those students will make you proud. But my daughter talked about why it was important to have ethnic studies. And she talked about how it's more than a curriculum, how it's more than words on a page, that once you learn that, you are changed. She used a mathematical equation and said, I don't know where I'll use that unless I decide I'm gonna be something else. But ethnic studies, I use every day of my life. It helps me to understand the people around us. And one thing that I realize from being in buildings, when we talk about culture, when we talk about different ways of living, different times, and the truth of our history, not just our history, because I hear some garbage history. We had a native girl who just kept on coming in the sixth grade classroom. She didn't want to do that read 180 assignment, and I couldn't understand why. So I started telling her to unpack the story. She had historical trauma. It was a whole colonized story that was an untruth about her people, and her spirit would not digest it. I went and talked to three teachers, two administrators, said, I don't know what standard she needs to achieve, but please do not use that textbook to get it for her. She never came back to the sixth grade classroom. Our kids are spiritual, vibrational beings. Each and every one of them who are born to this earth were born for a purpose. 
I do restorative uh, circles around education. I did one recently, and we do it a part of a tra parent training that we do. And I ask this question. What if, in your education, you had an individual education plan that was designed for you and how you learned, that helped you to be who you were created to be? How would your life have been different? I had a circle full of highly educated people. None of them fulfilled their potential. So I say to you, when you look at that brilliance that's in front of you, do you have an individual education plan? And do you see their brilliance? Hi everyone, I'm Jennifer, and I identify as a decolonizing mixed Chicanx. That means that I am an adult who is having to unlearn the white supremacist narrative I was taught in the racist public school system I was educated in. It also means that I have a Mexican mother and a white father, and I've spent my entire life explaining that I really am the daughter of either of them. I don't identify as white, though I acknowledge that I have white passing privilege. I'm not ashamed also of being white, but so happy to be able to celebrate out loud how proud I am to be brown. While many people might reject labels, I actually have a few more that I'd like to add because I am also an ally, an accomplice, and a co-conspirator in the Black Lives Matter movement. I'd like to describe the work that I do in my classroom these days not so much as teaching history, but empowering youth to in the spirit of my uh, inspirational bell hooks to dismantle the imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy. I taught in the south end of Seattle in Rainier Valley for over a decade, and then last year after changing schools, I feel I've been effectively in an intensive studies program in white resistance in my new t teaching position in the north the end. I'm here tonight because in addition to being a classroom teacher of color and the BSU co-advisor in a white majority school, I am also a curriculum writer and advisory board member for SPS Ethnic Studies, and also an equity literacy coach for the Center for Racial Equity. I want to quickly acknowledge consultation I recently received from my colleague, the, colleague, the amazing Bruce Jackson, who shared a podcast with me called The Thread. It inspired me so much that I not only wrote a lesson around it for teaching in uh, for Black Lives Week, but also I made a t-shirt. Um, so during the week, my students learned about the soul force through the, listening through the podcast, The Thread. And we learned about the role of Bayard Rustin, James Fortin, Gandhi, and many others in the work that Dr. King did. Um, in the podcast, we hear audio of Dr. King saying that he's proud to be maladjusted in a racist society. Well, I too am happy to be maladjusted with a racist society and a racist education system. King goes on to share that physical force will be met with soul force and that this work lies in the hands of the creatively maladjusted. We need to be more creative. We need to let go of historically racist institutional practices like standardized testing and oppressive pedagogy like didactic lectures in European content. Let's make these truly history. I want to speak briefly for now on the work being done for the Center for Racial Equity. The CRE was started by the inspirational Marquita Prenzing, who could not join us tonight. The team of mostly female and mostly female of color coaches are teachers who work with site-based racial equity teams at Seattle schools to help strengthen their voices to redress inequities inside their own buildings. We also create and facilitate workshops on equity literacy and other special topics like identity development and allyship. If anyone's thinking that's a lot of work, well, it is. Um, but the work we do, we do in community, and then it doesn't feel like work. It feels like, well, the soul force. I never knew the power of working in community because I've never had it in Seattle Public Schools. But I do now, and I want to say, may the soul force be with you. 
I'm also here representing the Ethnic Studies program led by my personal hero, Tracy Castro Gill. The framework for ethnic studies is modeled after the one adopted by Oakland Unified School District. And the fourth themes for, for this is uh, identity, power and oppression, resistance and liberation, and then action. We also create and facilitate workshops on text selection, and we recently created a racial text analysis tool that asks educators to consider whether the characters in novels match the identities of the authors. If not, why are you using this text? What else could you use? Though we have made large strides to bring ethnic studies to Seattle schools, we need more action. I was raised in a white supremacist education system in Texas in the 1990s. Well, it's 2019, and the Texas School Board has adopted ethnic studies statewide. So where are we at, Seattle? I need to share a reality with you, and that reality is that the hardest part of my day is not working with students of color who don't see themselves reflected in the culture of the white supremacist institution that they go to school in. Ethnic studies helps a little bit with that. But the hardest part of my day is actually deflecting the constant barrage of passive and active resistance to this work from self-proclaimed progressive liberal adults who falsely believe that they are already doing the work or it doesn't apply to them. And, thank you. and from students who are so beyond privilege that they freely make racist and sexist jokes and outright express how learning black history is, quote, a waste of their time. And I am outraged. And you don't have to be black to be outraged. I have to assume there are some teachers and teacher candidates here tonight. If you aren't black and you aren't teaching ethnic studies yet, the single most important lesson I have learned is consultancy. If you're teaching black history, are you centering black voices? Are you using the Teaching for Black Lives book? Did you consult with any black colleagues or students? I ask myself these questions every time before I proceed with my plans. The second most important lesson I've learned so far is language. Use your words. Don't say you are not racist. Say you are an anti-racist. If you can't say out loud right now that you're an anti-racist, then your homework tonight is to go home and practice in the mirror until you can say that. Because in, until you can, you are complicit in perpetuating institutionalized racism. Say it, say you're an anti-racist, and then back it up with action. Remember, you do not have to be black to be outraged. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm very excited uh, and honored to get to introduce three students from Garfield High School that I've worked a whole lot with. Um, Y'all are welcome to come on up. Kevon Avery. We have Chardonnay Beaver and Janelle Gary. I'm going to let them tell you about their brilliant work, and I'll turn you over to the real teachers now. How's everybody doing this evening? Great. Awesome. So uh, first we would like to do introductions. My name is Chardonnay Beaver. I am a senior at Garfield High School. Hi, I'm Janelle Gary. I'm also a senior at Garfield High School. And then I'm Kevon Avery, and I'm also a senior at Garfield High School. <laughs> um, first, I want to start off with a poem that's actually from the book. It's about two set, taking two sets of notes, which is something that a lot of us had to struggle with in school because it's not something that's explicitly laid out for you. You always have to, you know, dig into the cracks and crevices to find something that relates to you. So it's actually, I don't know if anybody has the book with them, but if you want to read along, it's on page 68. Sorry. Oh, that's falling. Okay. All right. So it goes, I find myself feeling as if I am touching both ground and ceiling. In schools that do not engage in healing, they simply open wounds and entrap me in rooms where I'm consumed by hypocrisy, like who authored Greek philosophies? And the statues on campus be watching me, Washington, Jefferson, Williams, clocking me. As if to say, time's up. But I don't run laps on tracks, I run laps around the scholars of tomorrow because their new schools of thought are merely the, oh, sorry, are merely old histories borrowed. 
And that was just a small excerpt, but it really, mm -hmm. I think that it really shows that a lot of times this history isn't in the textbooks. You know, everybody wants to say, well, it doesn't really follow our core curriculum or it's not applicable to school. It's not, I think that one thing that a lot of schools struggle with is that it doesn't have to be, you know, a part of your core curriculum. It's in our everyday lives, as you know, I've heard earlier today. Um, and that's just something that teachers have to recognize. Um, okay. So one thing that we do um, that we've had the privilege of either being in our, uh, Mr. Hogopian's ethnic studies class, attending or have attended that class, is uh, something that we got from the Khan people of West Africa. It's, um, it's a saying, uh, Boa. Me na me mo wo, and it means help me and let me help you. So it's how we're gathered here in this room, and it's taking our knowledge and putting it together and figuring out what way and what direction can we go in with the knowledge and putting it into each other and learning. So I was wondering if you guys can repeat after me, please, of the saying. But I'm gonna need you guys to have a lot of passion because it's a lot of knowledge <laughs> that we're learning. Okay, Boa. Me na me, me na me, mo wo wo, mo wo wo. One more time. Boa, boa, me na me, me na me, mo wo wo, mo wo. Thank you. All right. So, uh, just a quick, you know, little snippet of how we got started. Um, so it circulated. Um around the death of Charlena Lyles, who was a Seattle Public Schools mother who was brutally murdered, and I strongly emphasize the word murdered, by uh, Seattle police. And we went the whole day without hearing about it. It wasn't on the news. It wasn't circulating around the school. And it was actually until me and Janelle and a fellow member, Israel Presley, had Miss Hergopian uh, our sophomore year in high school that we found out about this horrendous event that happened in, you know, our own backyard. Um, so we were outraged, we were saddened, and we spent the whole class period talking about it. I think that was one of the biggest parts that I remember in uh, my whole high school career is that we were able to sit in a classroom and talk about how this affects us, how we take the things that we learn in the classroom and how we apply it to everyday lives. Um, so with that said, uh, we got together with Chardonnay and uh, she does ASV at Garfield. So um, a lot of leadership in all of us and we planned a rally in less than 24 hours and we had media coverage with the help of Mr. Gopian. And we just all stood together on the front steps of the school and we just raise our voices, we raise our fists and say that this is enough, you know, we're independent, we're smart, and you're not going to hold us back any longer. So that's how we started. Uh, right on. Hear me? Okay, great. Uh, and so I'm just going to talk about the mission of New Generation, because after that event, we knew that this was something that works like we are just meshing together well, and we have to continue this because there's so many problems that we have to tackle. And so uh, our mission statement is to educate people within and outside of the black community on issues such as racism, implicit bias, the school to prison pipeline, et cetera. And these are important to us because we've all experienced them firsthand. Uh, some events that we have done within the last two years, um, just a reminder, Charlena's death happened uh, in June 2017, and so we have been going ever since then. And um, some things that we've done is we met with various Black Panther Party uh, members, which has been incredible. Uh, because it is Black History Month, we just want to give them a shout out because we love them. Uh, we've got an award by Michael Bennett Foundation uh, for Youth Leaders of the Year. And we've also done an event at Garfield called Remember Her Name. Uh, it's very easy to make these hashtags called Say Her Name but remember her name just reinforces the idea of she is still a woman, she was still a mother, she was still lively and impacted people's life. She's not just a mirror image. And so um, that's what we've been up to. So many more, but those are just a few. <laughs> Um, we also want to recognize our other members that were able to be here tonight. Um, Jamaica H., who is a senior at Garfield. Moya McKinney, who is a senior. Uh, Israel Presley, who is a senior at Rainier Beach High School. And also Miles uh, Gillespie. He's at Howard right now. So he's there doing some work and continuing on this new gen legacy. 
Um, so I also, I wanted to um, give a quote, which is from page 10 of Teaching for Black Lives. Um, it says, teaching for black lives also means considering the loneliness of learning about one's history when you might be one of the few students in the class or a few teachers in the school that this history represents. So what this means to us is that we all felt this loneliness, and we really felt it with Charlena Lyles, that the fact that this was a Seattle Public Schools black mother and her story was not being heard, just the fact that we had to learn it from one of our only black teachers in the whole school building, and it wasn't until my fifth period finding out, because that's when I had him, and we went through the whole day with just going through these other lessons, master narratives that they wanted to teach us and they never wanted to sit down and give us the greatest lesson, which is what's going on right now. So what we did was we took that loneliness and we took that lack of representation that our people have and how it gets lost in the media because we know the Trayvon Martins, but we don't know a lot of the other names. And I really think we need to do our research and figure out those other names and why their stories aren't being talked about and why they're not heard because that is loneliness in that. Um, I feel lonely. I feel the loneliness of her children having to go on to school, no one, their classmates not knowing what's going on. Seattle making them feel and have that loneliness with not being able to talk about their story. The fact that it's going on almost two years now and people still don't know the story. So I feel that loneliness. That could have been one of our moms or dads. So we took that loneliness that we also feel in the classroom and that's how we could really relate to this topic because not only is police brutality happening, but there's also injustices that are happening in the classroom with the education system. So what we did was is that we took that, we put into our work in New Generation, and we're trying to break that gap and have the conversation of why. Why did it take us so long to hear her story? Why aren't we hearing other stories? And so we also want to just thank Mr. Hagopian for letting us hear that story, because if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't be here today. Um, <laughs> Yeah, um, I think that a lot of what Janelle uh, said goes for, you know, myself, Chardonnay, and probably a lot of other people in the room, is that, you know, it's just such an outrageous experience to have to go through high school and not have yourself written anywhere in the curriculum. So, you know, as, um, so like, as New Gen, I think that a lot of what sparked us to get engaged was definitely the murder of Charlena Lyles. And the reason that being is because, um, like the poem said, we had to take two sets of notes. You know, we had to hear it at the end of the day through the grapevine from, you know, a tremendous teacher as Mr. Gopian. Um, and it was just, for me, myself, it was humiliating. It was devastating. I felt traumatized to be in a school where I would walk around, I walked out the hall um, after fifth period and I was like, yo, did you guys hear about Charlene Lyles? Like, this is Seattle. Like, I thought this was happening on the East Coast, down South. You know, just where racism is up in your face, it's up front, you know. They'll say thing, they'll say derogatory terms in front of you, but here in Seattle, it's very passive. It's very undertone. And a lot of the other students, a lot of the other staff were like, no, what happened? And I think that, um, that shows the work that our school district needs to do is that we shouldn't have to take these two sets of notes. We shouldn't have to find our media through, or we shouldn't have to find um, our resources through these other outlets, and it should just be right there provided for us, but it's not. Um, so what we've been doing is providing a voice for uh, our fellow peers and providing that, you know, this stuff happens, it still affects us. We've provided, um, just spaces where we can talk and discuss and educate as well uh, because it's not going to be shown in the curriculum at this point but we hope that you know soon it incorporates itself into all curriculum and yeah um so i really love this book well we love this book a little biased because mr gopian <laughs> But also just because it speaks to our experience and it speaks to our truth. And so uh, as you guys being people who are going to move into the classroom or who may already be in the classroom, we really wanted to bring you in. And so I have this quote here on page 185. Anybody have their book? You can flip to it. But it says, we need teachers who will examine themselves as racial, be racial beings who teach other racial beings and figure out what they are doing wrong 
and what they're doing right. That's very important. And uh, as students, we've just encouraged during the uh, Black Lives Matter week. Anybody know what the Black Lives Matter at school week is? Awesome, okay, that's great. Uh, we just encourage teachers to really humanize themselves and see students as humans. A lot of times, we as black students can walk through the hallways and feel like silhouettes uh, because we're either not seen or nobody's speaking to our stories or nobody's like, hey, how are you doing today? You know, what are you guys up to? And it is getting better because thankfully we have um, the ethnic studies class, but it's not a consistent thing to where we can be like, I'm, unapolog I'm unapologetically black today and I can walk through my hallways and that's accepted. And so I think validating black experience is very vital. And then another quote that I have that I feel like could help you guys <laughs> in the future is the importance of the reconstruction era. We have really taken the time to educate ourselves, whether that's through, you know, calling each other up on the weekends, like, hey, did you guys see these things? Did you guys see these social events that are happening? How do you feel? And taking moments to create that dialogue. But in sum, the reconstruction era was a moment when black lives, black actions, and black ideas mattered. We need to get back to that as a society. We need to get back to that in the classroom to feel like, one, I matter, my voice matters, my experience matters, and my presence in this classroom is vital and critical to the development of everyone. They're gonna have um, all our uh, extraordinary presenters come up um, and form a little panel here. And as they're doing that, let's just give them all uh, another huge round of appreciation. So we, we do have time for um, maybe two, possibly three questions. Um, uh, if you are interested in asking a question of the pan of, of our um, our guests, uh, what we would ask you to do is um, come down here if you want to ask a question, and we'd ask you to have a question. Um, Not a question. Statement. Um, uh, because we, there's th this brilliance here and it's, it's, it's a real gift to be able to um, hear this experience and, and hear this expertise. So please though, we would love to have a, a question or two or maybe even three. <laughs> you also could ask each other a question if we're wa while we're waiting. So asked, asking about trauma counselors um, in this in the schools, and and I'm I'm thinking about you, um, Jesse. You had put up the the um, the demands, and that last one, counselors, you know, not cops. And then I and, and I and I heard of, I was hearing about Oakland, and so I just also wanted to give a shout out to the Oakland teachers who are on strike right now, yeah. and that is one of the demands of many of these teachers' strikes. And so these are all things that are all connected. You know, in terms of how how we get them, I think. Educators across the country are showing us how you struggle and how you win, right? And we saw last year it started in the red states, the red state revolt, the entire state shut down. And, and here we have Republican-controlled legislatures where you have the governor and, the, and both chambers of Congress all vowed to never raise taxes, especially on the wealthy uh, in, in that state. And then within several days, they all had to go back on those campaign promises because the entire education system was shut down. And the teacher said it will reopen when the wealthy get ready to actually pay something to help students, right? And then in West Virginia, winning 5% raise for every public employee uh, was just un unheard of. It would have seemed fantastical and impossible to achieve that. But then the, the power of solidarity and, and workers showing that we actually are the one that make this system run and we can actually shut it down as well um, taught, 
I think, a really important political lesson to this country, that politics isn't just waiting every four years to cast a ballot, but it can be you taking action in your workplace. And now we've seen it spread across the country. LA, second biggest school system, they went on strike this year, and I went down to speak uh, at a forum with their striking educators on the second to last day of the strike. 60,000 persons, sea of red downtown, um, right, paralyzing the city. And then uh, their demands were incredible. Uh, a nurse in every school. You'd think that we would have that in the world's richest country, but no, right? So they had to fight for a nurse in every school, for more counselors, right? For librarians in the schools. They fought to, to get rid of uh, standardized testing. They, got, they cut it by 50%, a commitment from the school board to cut it by 50%. And I think one of the most incredible, couple of the most incredible demands about anti-racist work was uh, number one, ending the random searches that aren't so random that end up with black and brown kids being taken out of class by police officers and humiliated with these searches. And then the other thing that really uh, is so touching is that they fought to get the school, the school district to have to supply millions of dollars for legal aid to Latinx families, uh, immigrant families, um, who are facing the terror of ICE raids, right? And that showed a real commitment by the union to a social justice strategy of unionism, of partnering with black and brown communities. And that's, I think, what it's gonna take to win any more resources, whether it's, it's more counselors uh, or nurses. In, here in Seattle, the district just proposed cutting school librarians to all the high schools to 50%, right? And so this is, we're in a contract year now. This is what we're gonna have to be ready to fight for. I also wanna add, your legislature hears very little about education in our children. That's why our schools are underfunded. They hear more about those trees out there than they do our future. What we can do to get more counselors is make our legislature truly fund education and to let them know the importance of it. The other is our building leadership teams in our schools. They are the ones who decide on that budget and that staffing. It's very important to let them know that those are important for our kids and it's not just any counselor. They have to have relationship with our kids. They have to see them as whole human beings. Too many of our kids are being pathologized. And so we don't want that. We want people who are going to teach them how to breathe through what they're going through and also help them to be able to tell their story to dismantle what they're experiencing. So we're gonna have one, one final question. First question. Um, I'm a teacher for Seattle preschool programs and I'm extremely disappointed that I only see two of my colleagues here. Hey Fanny, hey Jordan. Um, as a teacher of the babies, they're all of our future. To the students and the people in the panel, what advice do you have? My job is to prepare these babies to enter the K through 12 system that is failing my two black sons. Any advice? Um, I would say, just based off my experience, it's a, it's a really important to start them young. Um, because we're taught these things at a young age and then once we get to high school, it's like kind of unlearning all the things that we've been taught. Um, so what I would say is notice the little things at a young age, because it's not just like it happens. There's things that you notice um, with education or how other teachers are treating them. Um, try to understand their stories. Um, I believe that children tell the truth um, more than the rest of us. I feel like we try to sugarcoat things and we try to sound perfect. Um, and I think with children, they're just gonna give it to you 100%. 
So um, if you talk to them, I believe that they will share their experiences and their stories and you'll be amazed about what they have to say. Um, so talking to them, getting to know them, and just noticing little things, because sometimes it can be little things that add up to those big things. Um, and I think that will really help out, help you out in the classroom and also just teaching them about themselves and that's some, because they might not get their history when they're older. So starring them and teaching them their history now would help them. I, oh yeah, that was good. <laughs> I just wanna, I just wanna add one more thing real quick. Affirmation, I think a lot of times teachers are uncomfortable. You have to start speaking what my mom would say, life into these children. You don't know what they can go through. They may count as lower income. They may come from uh, higher class communities. It doesn't matter. You have to start telling them you are worthy of love. You are worthy of equal treatment. You are worthy of respect. And you will walk through society with your head up because you know these things. So instilling value into them. I just wanted to add in, um, in, in terms of ethnic studies, um, that there are lessons being written. I write primarily secondary education plans, but there are um, early education plans being written. Uh, right now, as we speak, we're looking for more early education uh, leaders, especially leaders of color, to join us in the work and do that work. Um, I do want to give a shout out quickly to one of my colleagues here, Caitlin Kamalai Jenkins. If you can just, she's, she just does the same thing I do. I just want to recognize you. Um, um, and is working with preschool and writing, uh, sorry, first grade, and also um, curating collections of books that are for students of color. So we're working uh, as hard as we can to get all of these things out to you as soon as we can. So. I'll just say briefly that if you go to the blacklivesmatteratschool.com website, um, there's a button for lesson plans and there's curriculum for, for preschool even that I think is really powerful. There's also preschool and early elementary lessons in teaching for black lives that I've done um, trainings with, with educators that I think are really powerful. And I think folks should get um, Rethinking Schools quarterly magazine that has lessons, but also our book, um, Rethinking Early Childhood Education, are a bunch of resources I'd recommend. And lastly, we did an exercise today in my classroom where we looked at um, suspension rates from a whole lot of different angles. And one of the things was looking at preschool students getting suspended and how it's dramatically disproportionately black students and looking at models of restorative justice that need to go all the way into our preschool programs. And I would, I think one of the things that we do at Rethinking Schools, and I think the approach in general is like, have to dispel the myth, or dispel the idea, I guess it's a myth, that, that kids are too young to deal with this stuff. Right now, you gotta do it in development appropriate ways, and you know, think about vocabulary and how stuff gets framed, but, but um, I, I actually think it's a function of white privilege to not talk to your kids about this stuff, right? Um, and so we just, you know, I, I'm a parent of a non-black child, um, but that doesn't mean that we're not having, uh, as an Asian American kid, he, you know, we're having these conversations. Um, and it's important, I think, even, you know, he came to his literacy with Black Lives Matter signs in his neighborhood, and he's reading them, and they're having these conversations. Like, you need, like, that's, that's, we need to understand that's what's happening, because kids are forming their notions of race and relations uh, at that age. And if we don't talk about it, they're, you know, we, like, we need to be really intervening at that time. Uh, I also have something uh, kind of ties into what Chardonnay was saying earlier, but um, conditioning representation into their lives from early on, um, that's really important. It all, a lot, especially when you're younger, it can boil down to the toys that you play with, the books that you read, the songs that you learn, and it really is detrimental to your self-esteem and your self-worth, as Chardonnay was saying. So really making sure that you have a broad spectrum of, you know, toys, lesson plans, songs, just different things, because that could really have somebody walk into the world, you know, kindergarten, first grade, all the way up until college, just knowing that I am worthy, I am somebody that's worth paying attention to, and I am, you know, the definition of human. And, you know, everybody deserves that. Thank you. Um, and briefly, and, I, and you spoke to it um, some, is the dessert reading, the books that you put in front of them. 
because it could speak life into them, could create a whole conversation, or it can make doubt in them. Look hard. Um, our libraries need support. They get $20 a student in Seattle Public Schools that does not go to our libraries. Fight for literature. Fight for black artists. Um, look, share that knowledge because black and brown children are not reading enough because they're not seeing themselves in literature that we know is out there. Find it, put it in their hands, help them to be readers and help them to see themselves in the literature. You good? So we just wanted to thank everybody again. We, we have um, these frames that we'd like to give you that have uh, the, the flyer um, with your names on it, this poster that we made um, with that beautiful book cover. And uh, again, we just uh, we thank each of you for the work you're doing, and we join you in that work. And uh, there will be books for sale. There will be um, book signing. I've got the Sharpies because the, 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 co the, the color pages on this Teaching for Black Lives, you, you got to use the Sharpie to get, get that signature in there. Um, and thank you so much for, for this beautiful evening, and thank you all for being here. <laughs>